Hello, this is Andrew Al from Digital Charlotte, and welcome to the Digital Inclusion Exchange podcast. Today, we'll be listening to the Di- National Digital Inclusion Alliances, also known as the NDIA's Net Inclusion Webinar Series. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance Net Inclusion Conference has been a staple in the digital inclusion community for years, bringing hundreds of practitioners, advocates, academics, internet service providers, and policymakers together to share their knowledge. With social distancing in place, the NDIA is hosting the Net Inclusion 2020 webinar series to replace the conference. This series includes eight one-hour webinars recorded live from September 16th through November 4th. You can find the full schedule, recordings, and resources at digitalinclusion.org slash net inclusion 2020 webinar series. The link to this will be in the description. Today's webinar topic is research and data to convince locally, to advocate with state and federal policymakers, and to allocate limited resources. First recorded on September 23rd, 2020. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. Uh, This is the Net Inclusion second I don't know how to say that right. Net inclusion webinar series, second one. We've never had a webinar series. We're all supposed to be in person, but this is gonna be awesome because we have a rock star panel. Uh, Net inclusion usually is this great community building event that NDIA holds. So I try not to cry too much to the fact that that's not happening uh, because it really is about building those relationships. And we're gonna try to replicate that as much as we can here together. Uh, So there, We've set up net inclusion webinar series as um, weekly, so as not to overwhelm folks. We are recording all of them. So if you can't make it all the way through, it's okay. You can catch the rest of it later. Uh, We are also making sure that there's plenty of time for question and answer. So we've set these up as a one hour panel with question and answer. Uh, And then we have a bonus 30 minutes. So for those who can stick around for the bonus 30 minutes for some more Q&A with our panelists, that's great. If you have to head off, you will have caught caught the bulk of it. And that's super important. I don't know where Roberto just went. (laughs) Roberto, you're a panelist, you have to come back. So the way we're going to get this started um, is that we're going to have everybody uh, go around and they're going to tell you uh, who they are and the awesomeness that they do. Uh, Real quick, though, in the Q&A, we're going to use that mostly for questions that you would like to ask the panelists. And then we're going to try to keep the chat for logistical kind of, I can't hear somebody (laughs) kinds of issues. Uh, But then also, um, you know, asking for a URL. Uh, NDIA staff is on and they are ready to throw in any of the resources that any of our panelists um, reference. Or if you know something that you want to share, again, we are a community. We are sharing with each other. So we're going to make sure that everything is in there that you need. All righty, we're going to get started. Uh, Amanda, can I have you uh, explain who you're with, what you do? Sure. Thanks so much, Angela, and thanks for coordinating this fabulous series. I always know that anything that NDIA organizes is gonna have people I can learn a lot from, and this is no exception. I'm a senior fellow at National Skills Coalition. We are a DC-based policy advocacy organization. We've been around for about 20 years. We work exclusively on federal and state policy, and my focus is on adult education, digital literacy, and immigrant integration. Awesome, thank you. Autumn. Good afternoon. My name is Autumn Glover. I live in Columbus, Ohio, where I have the pleasure of serving as president of PACT, Partners Achieving Community Transformation. It's a nonprofit, community-based quarterback where we work every day to disrupt cycles of intergenerational poverty. Um, We do that through strategic program and project investments in one defined neighborhood. So uh, we really believe that place matters and really focusing on a place is really key to having long-term sustainable change. We just got into the space of closing the digital divide as a result of COVID-19, but it has quickly become a key priority for us. Um, I also serve in a dual role with the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, where um, I get to help lead projects related to community engagement, PACT being the primary focus for me. Awesome. Thank you, Autumn. Roberto. Hello, um, I'm uh, Roberto. I'm the director of the Purdue Center for Regional Development and a Purdue Extension Specialist. I'm uh, Autumn's next door neighbor over here. Um, 
We work a lot with uh, community and economic development organizations throughout Indiana and the country and help in a variety of ways. One of them is digital inclusion with an economic and economic development perspective. So I'm delighted and thrilled to be part of this wonderful panel. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Roberto. Leon. Good afternoon. I'm Autumn's northern neighbor. <laughs> I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> And I'm the Chief of Digital Innovation and Chief Information Officer at the Cleveland Foundation. Um, we're a community foundation, and I oversee philanthropic grant making in the space of addressing the digital divide throughout Greater Cleveland, Greater Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. Fabulous. Thank you, Leon. Hal. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Hal Woods. I am the uh, Chief of Policy at an organization called Kids First Chicago, Kid First uh, works a lot with families uh, and communities and with parents primarily uh, to help design uh, new policies or, or even revise existing ones uh, for the education system here in Chicago. Uh, we've been working on an initiative called Chicago Connected and very excited to share um, some of our, our development and some of our learnings uh, with the group today. Fabulous, thank you. We're gonna start with Roberto. So Roberto, you created the Digital Divide Index. It's something quite a few of NDIA's affiliates have found meaningful. Um, can you talk to us about how folks can use that index to start meaningful conversations, uh, particularly in how they make the digital divide feel less abstract? Yes, uh, we, we developed that precisely because pre-COVID, uh, the digital divide was kind of an abstract concept. And so we, we uh, crunched the numbers to come up with scores. Everybody understands scores. And in fact, the question I get a lot among communities is how's my neighbor doing? Uh, no reference to Leon or Autumn, but uh, uh, that's how they, that they grasp that. And so, of course, there's multiple ways to measure this, Angela. I'm not saying the data is perfect in there. There is some FCC data in there, but it is, a, a, um, it is attached to a larger concept of this digital divide uh, from an infrastructure perspective, an adoption perspective, and a socioeconomic perspective. And so that's how we found it is easy to be used. Now, it's not the ultimate tool. As I tell communities I work with, I would not use data from the FCC to go to Mars. I'm not sure we would make it to Mars, but I sure would use it to start talking about going to Mars. And so that's where we bring back what you were mentioning, Angela. For communities that were having a hard time visualizing this, at least it gets the conversation started and it kind of puts this abstract concept easy, in a format that easier to understand and discuss. So, so uh, that's, that's the objective of the DDI. It consists of three scores ranging from zero to 100, the higher the number, the higher the divide. And, and so that's basically what it amounts to. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and we do have the link for the digital divide index in the chat for those who are wondering what it looks like. Uh, so, so continue along the path of what's the data we already have right now. Uh, can we go with Amanda? Amanda, NDIA is a big fan of the research that the National Skills Coalition does because you're able to you create this fabulous graphics that show us uh, who doesn't have the skills. So tell us a little bit about your recently released research on digital skills gaps and what the key findings were of that research. Yeah, thanks so much. So National Skills Coalition recently looked at a data source called the PIAC, which has a long, unwieldy name, but the important thing to remember is it's a rigorous assessment of adult digital skills. And what we found from that is that digital skill gaps exist for nearly 48 million American adults, including nearly one third of currently employed workers. Um, and I think we'll be sharing a slide in just a moment that, that illustrates that, but basically 31% of workers who were employed at the time of the survey um, have digital skill gaps. And the slide we're looking at now looks at the particular breakdown of race and ethnicity. On the left-hand side, you see folks with no digital skills. On the right-hand side, you see folks with limited digital skills. Um, and as you can see from that, there is a plurality of workers um, in both cases who are white, but disproportionately workers of color are overrepresented among those with few or no digital skills. Um, workers with skill gaps exist across every industry. 
So this is not just a problem for one industry or another. We have some great individual stories from healthcare, from food service, from construction, from manufacturing. Um, and as you'll see in the next table, um, it's a list of major industries that highlights the percentage um, this is a different slide, uh, also interesting, about young workers, um, and we can talk about that in a minute. But there is a slide that you'll see at some point around um, uh, workers in different industries and the percentage who have limited or no skills. So for this slide, uh, I call this the kind of exploding policymakers assumption slide, right? Those of you who work in digital inclusion and digital access have probably been part of some conversation where somebody said to you, oh, this isn't a problem for the young generation. They're all digital natives. They don't have any skill gaps. Instead, what we actually see is, yes, they absolutely do have skill gaps. And more than that, younger workers, like everyone, have what's called fragmented knowledge. This concept that somebody might be very comfortable texting a photo or creating a TikTok, but perhaps not comfortable creating a spreadsheet. Um, and so it's really incumbent on us as digital literacy advocates to kind of figure out how to help people build bridges from the knowledge they have to the skills that they need. Super, thank you, Amanda. Amanda, talk to us a little bit about how those digital skills gaps overlap with the issue of broadband access. Yeah, I like to say digital literacy is kind of dependent on the threshold issues of broadband access and device access. And I have some amazing colleagues on today's call who I know are going to delve into these issues in more detail. But it's really important to understand that the same factors that correlate with low digital literacy, like, for example, people who have low earnings, also make it hard for people to pay for broadband access or pay for digital devices. That's not the only factor, but it's a pretty significant one. And of course, when people don't have broadband or don't have an up-to-date device or they're sharing a device with other family members, that makes it harder for them to build the skills that they need. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so, so let's switch topics just a little bit and head into sources of support. Uh, how, how do we get these projects done? Uh, Leon, can you talk to us a bit about how you are managing to gather corporate folks uh, involved in the digital inclusion efforts in Cleveland? Um, sure thing, Angela. And actually, because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, that's where corporate America really has woke, woken up regarding this digital divide. Um, I say it time and time again, when the schools all shut down, everybody had to shelter in their homes and the libraries closed down, everybody woke up to the, what, what was going on, what we in this community have been talking about for years. Corporations, um, big and small, have been wondering how can they help? And they're doing it in kind of two ways. One is obviously, can we, can we give money to the issue? Can we make a donation? Can we make a pledge? And, but first what they're trying to figure out is how big the problem is where the problem lies, where should they spend their money most prudently? Should they give to the school district or should they give to a nonprofit? To, should they give to some other entity like the city and have them disperse the funds? So they're, they're, they're reaching out. So if you operate kind of a coalition or a local digital inclusion alliance, they're probably needing your assistance to help them under, understand where to shepherd their money if they're making a contribution. What they're also trying to do for those, that for those who aren't able to or not or don't care to maybe make um, a financial donation, they're um, looking for unique ways where they can contribute their resources. So they're donating their recycled computers. Most corporations today, especially large, you know, Fortune 1000 companies, they have a, they have a standard three-year cycle when they do a PC or what they call it a hardware refresh. So every three years, they just basically cycle out all their laptops and desktops and bring in a new set so that their employees can never have a lot of major tech issues. What are they doing with that equipment? Um, so now they're looking to, well, can we donate that equipment to the school district? Can we donate that equipment to a nonprofit that will then get that out? Can we donate that equipment to a housing authority? So what we're seeing here in Cleveland, and I'm sure it's happening in other places, either they're partnering in <clears throat> with their local chamber of commerce. So the chamber of commerce is, is stepping up and reaching out to its membership and saying, hey, here's how you can give, here's how you can contribute. And they're doing it through either through dollars by contributing to a fund, or they're finding ways that where they can, um, re um, where they can, where they can donate the equipment. The great thing about actually donating the equipment, <clears throat> excuse me, is that because they have so much of it, 
you can get a lot of similar hardware. So if you're donating to a school district, it's far more savable to get one or two sets of the model as opposed to every type of computer you can imagine by individual Jane and John Doe's donating equipment. You want to see that in that way. But that's how, that's how they're contributing right now, either through dollars, through computers, or through both. Super. Thank you, Leon. How Chicago has a pretty amazing group of financial supporters and partners. Um, can you talk to us a bit about the diversity of that group? Yeah, so we, uh, we've got an initiative here in Chicago, Chicago Connected, which uh, attempts to serve 60,000 households or roughly 100,000 students in Chicago Public Schools. Um, so the, the, the project really came together um, first uh, from elevating the issue, and so we, we were able to use uh, both kind of parent voice experience with the digital divide back in March, really when uh, when the pandemic set and schools were closed, married with uh, with with uh, American community survey data in terms of outlining what the divide was. But that that was the impetus for uh, for the city really to come to the table uh, for the city's philanthropic community uh, and also for internet service providers to come to conceive of an initiative where um, we were able to ser uh, secure about five million dollars of CARES Act funds from the city. Uh, but then $19 million uh, from the philanthropic community over the first two years of what will be a four-year initiative, uh, ultimately to support uh, overall. And so I think, um, you know, we've had some tremendous donors that sort of indicated uh, to the philanthropic community, to the broader philanthropic community, um, that this is an interest uh, for them and they were willing to support. Uh, it brought folks to the table that are honestly like are not even necessarily interested in education issues that are more focused on uh, workforce development uh, and in other uh, housing uh, issues, immigration services, but seeing um, the benefit of connecting, you know, roughly, you know, over 100,000 folks uh, for free internet service through a sponsored agreement. Uh, a lot, it helped bring philanthropy to the table. And obviously, you know, the city was very uh, charitable in terms of uh, donating CARES Act funds to the, to the program as well. My neighbor decided to mow their lawn. So <laughs> I'll be muting periodically. Uh, so uh, thank you, Hal. We are seeing in some communities where this, there's this collaborative effort to figure out the solutions. Um, and as NDIA, since we've been, many of our affiliates been working on this for so long, we're thrilled to see many more folks getting involved in those solutions. Uh, I happen to live in the same city as Autumn. Uh, so it's been really fascinating for me to be able to be a part of those discussions and get to know Autumn through those discussions. Autumn, can you share with folks how that's been developing in Columbus, Ohio? Sure. I mean, very similar to what Leon and um, Hal mentioned in Columbus in March as a result of, you know, the, the community being really forced into a digital society. Our Columbus Foundation and Columbus Metropolitan Libraries actually convened a working group to think about broadband access. Um, I think that initially started with how do we make sure kids can continue to learn? Uh, through that collaboration, the City of Columbus leveraged CARES Act dollars that enabled our Columbus City School District to purchase 20,000 Chromebooks. So um, that got them to um, nearly, if not all the way there to a one-to-one -one opportunity for kids in Columbus City Schools, which was a huge feat, um, really made possible by the 8 a.m. collaborative working group meetings. Um, we also have our Mid-Ohio Regional Planning um, organization that's partnering with PCs for People, which is actually very active in Leon's community. And really, we're, we're learning from what's happening in Cleveland, but also looking at how our corporate community can get engaged with refurbished equipment and getting those to families who need them, including um, Wi-Fi hotspots as well. So very similar efforts, um, but really made possible through collaboration and Honestly, on January 1st, none of us probably thought we would be meeting on a weekly basis talking about these things, but that's really what it takes is everybody um, digging in and, and getting their hands in the dirt and really making it happen for kids. Our working group has really expanded to talking about our community's broadband needs at large, which I think is absolutely excellent in the direction we need to go. So I'm thrilled at the momentum and that we solved one problem, but there's still much more to do. That's perfect. So let's make sure we come back to that issue of short term, long term. Uh, it seems like lots of communities are struggled, struggling with that. But I wanted to bring up one of the things Autumn mentioned was uh, PCs for people. And so a story I tell often is there's this guy, his name's Leon, he lives in Cleveland. He started figuring out what was going on in Cleveland, uh, figuring out what the gaps were, and he helped bring PCs for people to Cleveland. And then when all this hit, 
I think they were more ready. Leon, do you yeah. think you were more ready because you had, you and all the other community members that you've been working with had been studying this? You would, I mean, you had NDIA doing reports. Talk to me about that. Oh, absolutely. It's one of those things where they say, luck is opportunity meeting prepara preparation. <laughs> and we were lucky in that sense because we have been focused on this, at least the Cleveland Foundation <clears throat> and the Cleveland community has been focused on this since about 2017 when I, when I started really getting involved in it and commissioned my first study with NDIA to help us understand the, the hyper-local issues within Cleveland and also nationwide. But because of that, we had laid a lot of, tr a lot of tracks along Cleveland. We had did a lot of funding with our local digital literacy um, centers, both um, standalone centers and also with our public libraries, county and citywide. We had brought in, as you said, PCs for People about two years ago. So by the time all this hit, PCs for People had two years or at least 18 months of runway to really build the local relationships with the Goodwills, with the Salvation Armies, with the, with the men's shelters, with the banks and everybody else that they were just ready when the calls start ringing off the hook and people were familiar with them already. Um, we had already, with the libraries, we had already started library hotspot lending programs about a year and a half ago as well. So, the, so we knew what hotspots could do because we've been running hotspot programs for about almost two years now. So we knew, the, we knew the weaknesses and strengths of them and how they operated in Cleveland because it's still a cellular network. Where are the dead zones in Cleveland so, we, so that we don't overpromise? So absolutely, without a doubt. And plus, because when everybody started asking all sorts of questions, we knew a number of the answers. We leveraged R Roberto's DDI index years ago to help you know tell our story to build our maps and so forth so when the corporate community came to the table wanting to know and they want to commission yet another study i said well you can spend seventy thousand dollars if you want for another darn study but we can just tell you what you're going to find out <laughs> um and cut through the chase so you know things like that so absolutely um, for many of us in this in this community that have been doing this for many many years we were really ready to rock and roll when it happened Super. Thanks, Leon. Roberto, real quick, just because I know this is going to keep coming up, can you do a description for us of explaining um, uh, Census American Community Survey data and then um, FCC Form 477 data, differences between them? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, you're, it's apples and oranges, basically. That's why the more robust the metric you use, the better. That has shown in our research, statistical boring stuff. Um, but the ACS is, is, uh, is uh, modeled, but it has a margin of error attached to it. It's based on a survey. It has particular questions that we can, you know, argue about if, if, are they the correct questions or not, whatever it is. It's a survey. It has a margin of error. It uh, comes out for all counties starting in 2017, every, well, for computer use and internet uh, every five years. Well, the, the, the window is five years, uh, just because the margin of error is too large to, for, to do it for one single year. But I'm not gonna get statistical boring right now. Now, FCC, on the other hand, is provider self-reported data, which we all know has its own issues. However, it is very granular, much granular than the ACS. It has to be treated with a grain of salt. Like I said, don't go to Mars using it, but talk about going to Mars. So you're really talking about apples and oranges. So the lesson learned here, uh, Angela, is if you are going to provide a robust picture, introductory picture, uh, short of gathering your own data, like Leon and Autumn and others, uh, make sure you bundle them in a way that you, they leverage, play off each other, because one on its own will have its limitations. And I hope that I didn't go too statistically. That is just perfect. Thank okay. you. So now, Autumn, you looked at that data and you're like, we need some better data. That's really neighborhood based. Tell us about the survey that you did. Sure. So I, I would say, you know, I appreciate FCC data and American Community Survey, but the advantage that we have at PACT is that we know our neighborhood very well. And so looking at the data, I knew that it would, there were significant gaps just anecdotally from the relationships that we have in the community over the last 10 years. And so um, what we did was 
we started dreaming, right? And we, we came up with what we thought PACS Connected Community Strategy should be. And um, I'll tell you that it's really three pronged. And, and so I'll describe that. And then I'll describe a little bit of how we wanted to validate that through community engagement. So after learning um, from many of you and others across the country and in our local community, we decided that our goal was to achieve fixed internet for every household in our neighborhood. And that we wanted that fixed internet to be affordable and effective. And in Sure that people in our community had access to devices and digital literacy. And so these are things that folks in, in this webinar are familiar with, but we wanted to really define that. The next step was, and I believe strongly, that there is nothing that will ever re replace direct community engagement. And so even in the midst of COVID, we set out to do a door-to-door -door survey um, in our neighborhood. So we spent the month of August doing a door-to-door -door, door -door survey um, that we set up where we had surveyors go out, um, you know, masks and appropriate distance and they use iPads and it was a conversation. The categories of the survey, there were two. So one was just household technology provisions. We really wanted to understand what people had today. And then the second category was patterns and experiences of technology. From my perspective, doing the survey um, achieved multiple things. One of them was really to validate our assumptions about what was the very next thing that we needed to do to support our community. But it also served as an opportunity for us to educate our community. I think prior to doing our survey, if you ask someone um, the American Community Survey question, you didn't know what they were referring to when they said, yes, I have access to internet. We were very intentional about asking and helping to define what is fixed internet? How is that different than a cellular mobile hotspot and mobile internet or no access at all? Um, and so we did that door-to-door -door survey um, using a logic model. So there are about 17 possible questions. It's just about a six minute survey, but we gleaned a lot of information. So we know now um, that 39% of our residents don't even have reliable um, internet in their home um, and they don't understand what the different service off offerings are uh, from different providers. Uh, more than 60% of our, of our um, population told us that they have some form of internet in their home, but they weren't really sure how to define it before our surveyor um, asked them. Um, you know, I, I won't bore you with all the data that we got, but the two big learnings for us was that the two things that prevent people in our neighborhood from having the internet is the cost. Um, and so affordability came up and we asked people open-ended question if you were able to add the internet, at what price would it be attainable for your household? A lot of people told us a, a range that is much lower than what the low income provisions are by most providers. But we also noted that some people told us zero, even though they acknowledge that the internet is a platform that they need for life. Um, and that's really important to us because we talk about the internet as a platform for life. It's not just virtual learning for kids. It's work, it's health, there's social benefit to having access to the internet. Um, and the final note that I would say was surprising to me was the number of people who had fears and mistrust of the internet. Um, so you're talking about folks who have spent the last 20 years navigating life around internet access and they've been making a way without it. And prior to COVID-19 and being forced into a digital society, they were afraid of it almost. And so while that's a literacy um, piece, it's really important that we address that trust um, and really helping people understand how to navigate the internet. So the survey is invaluable. I don't think we would be ready for the next phase of our work without it. That's awesome. Thank you, Autumn. Let's talk a little bit about that education and the terminology that one uses when you're doing outreach, either through surveys or if you're just trying to get the service to them. How, what are some of the things that you're learning in Chicago about the words that one should use in this work? Yes, yeah, so we've, uh, and you know, uh, to Autumn's point about sort of trust in the internet, we've certainly been working, uh, you know, since we launched the initiative on June 25th, we've been working very diligently on bridging the trust gap. And so that trust gap uh, comes from a variety of ways. I mean, again, this is a sponsored service, so we're actually providing free internet service to these families uh, at the FCC definition of broadband. Um, but what we found is, you know, people don't respond well to large kind of macro outreach efforts, right? So robocalls, robotechs, um, I think all of us could probably appreciate if we get text messages that says, you know, congratulations, you get free internet, please click here. Uh, people 
that. Uh, we found that people have an aversion to the word free. Uh, I think we, we know that free, you know, nothing in life is free. We teach our, our children that as well. And so when people hear free, they think, um, you know, what does that mean from, you know, am I going to get nickel and dimed? Uh, there are hidden fees. And so we've, we've changed the messaging to make it clear that it is at no cost uh, to, to the household. And so that's been a, a big impact as well. I think um, some of the other uh, kind of modifications that we've made is particularly with respect to just understanding uh, both real and perceived barriers that people have to adoption. And so, uh, you know, we worked very diligently with our service providers to, uh, for instance, to ensure that past debt uh, did not preclude uh, someone from being actually being able to actually uh, enroll in the program. Um, but that perception uh, of knowing that 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 debt existed with that internet service provider prevented a lot of folks from actually making uh, taking advantage of that opportunity. And so, um, you know, working with our community partners and actually being able to have uh, you know, personalized, individualized calls and being able to have those partners that are making those outreach calls and those contacts um, aware of what those barriers are and being able to speak to them in a proactive way uh, has, has really led to a significant uptick in our adoption rate. Um, just things like, you know, social security number, being, being able to emphasize to folks that um, that is one of 30 different forms of ID that people can provide to prove their, their, their name. Uh, and so I think really, uh, you know, using, uh, you know, both the, the experience that our, our families are, you know, with the customer, uh, the, with the sign-up experience, you know, getting in intelligence from that, speaking with our community partners, uh, and being able to be nimble and kind of adapt uh, our, our kind of, you know, marketing or messaging uh, for the program has, uh, you know, helped significantly over the last few weeks. Super. Thank you, Hal. Leon, can you talk also about that community piece of it, the trust factor? No, absolutely. And just picking back, picking, <clears throat> picking back from Autumn and also Hal, I, I can't, um, can't, I, I can't agree enough about the whole idea about trust. Um, I think we all um, quickly try to parachute in with a lot of computers and free um, vouchers to get free internet or hotspots and all that sort of stuff. And we, and it's almost we have this: if we build it, they will come mentality. And then when they don't come. When it's a slow uptick, then we're scratching our heads wondering what the heck's going on. Um, that's because of a number of different things. One is because of the optics of, oh, free isn't free. There's got to be a catch. There's got to be, there's got to be a, a gimmick with it. I, I don't believe it. Um, and so, again, going back to trust or cynicism about it. Also, if we're promoting things, I think Autumn mentioned about this in our, in our um, prep call, if we're promoting something and saying, hey, we're going to give you affordable, we're going to give you low cost. For a number of people, those are code words for, oh, you give, you, oh you're, you're only advertising this to the poor people, you know, you, you know um, and that kind of thing. So, again, even when we went out there and we have a nonprofit here in Cleveland called Digital C that's trying to roll out, again, um, $20 a month broadband internet services. And when they went out knocking on doors and their first, they had their flyers saying affordable or free or, I mean, or low cost, they, when they were talking to the people, they were like, I don't like that word. Uh, so they had to retool their whole marketing of it. Um, when I was talking to one of our nonprofits that deal with immigrants and refugees, now you have a different level of trust because of immigration and because of language barriers. And because people may, when they live, they live in really tribes and the only person that they believe is their religious leader um, from that particular community. And if that religious leader doesn't say it's good, it's not good. So yeah, definitely the whole trust thing, what we have to, what we're now trying to do is put more energy and dollars into reaching out to grassroots organizations, the people who work with the people and, ha and use them as our ambassadors to spread the word and to um, basically um, ease trust issues and concerns and all those sorts of things. But yeah, trust and language definitely does matter. Language in, in a big L and a small L, because especially when you talk about immigrant population, our Latinx population, and the different derivatives of Latinx communities um, type of things, they only want to hear from who they know and who they feel comfortable with. So how NDIA has been super fascinated with the, um, the financial investment in the community-based organizations in Chicago Connected and how you all went about selecting those organizations. Can you explain that process? I was particularly interested in the application to be one of the Chicago Connected CBOs because this is about this long. Um, so yes, uh, we, I mean, this was, I, I will be honest and I will say that Chicago Connected really came from our community organizations. We had 
Uh, we had we were hearing from uh, from parents certainly about the connectivity challenge uh, that folks were facing once remote learning became a reality here in Chicago. Um, many community organizations uh, uh, knew that the connectivity gap was a pronounced one uh, and wanted to uh, wanted to help. Uh, they wanted to ensure that folks in their community had access to telehealth resources uh, to you know be able to file uh, unemployment claims online. Um, and so we, when we, when we, you know, kind of focused on, you know, making this a K-12 initiative at first, uh, we also wanted uh, to ensure that our community partners uh, were going to be a part of the process as well. And so um, it's, it's really threefold in terms of their responsibilities. One, I already talked a little bit about how they're supporting outreach, uh, which has been critical. Um, if we were relying exclusively on, uh, you know, CPS or the public school district to be just doing, again, kind of like the macro outreach, um, we wouldn't be where we are uh, right now, which is, you know, a little over 35,000 students connected uh, and over 25,000 households connected, uh, you know, going into for the school year. Um, so the outreach effort has been tremendous in terms of helping us to build the trust gap, uh, also identify operational challenges that people have uh, to being able to, uh, to sign up as well. Um, second, uh, we are working very closely with our community partners to launch uh, digital uh, literacy programs that will be offered, not uh, kind of like a cookie cutter, you know, one size fits all, but each uh, community organization, uh, you know, irrespective of their experience with digital literacy in the past, um, being able to launch their own program that is, uh, you know, really kind of taking a human-centered design approach and having both uh, families and community partners actually design what that program is going to look like with support uh, from, from our organization, but also from the overall project for the support from the incredible work that NDIA has done in this area as well. Um, but to allow these organizations to really kind of create the foundational skills necessary to de develop their own digital literacy programs that then as the city uh, expands uh, this connectivity program to beyond uh, this current subset of CPS families, there will be that foundation existing in the communities um, already that, that can be built upon as more folks uh, get involved. I think the third component is just knowing that um, what we've heard a lot from our community partners is um, uh, it is hard to reach people right now. Uh, it is, you know, a lot of our community partners have solidarity funds, uh, solidarity funds, people are not coming out and asking for help. Uh, and so whether it's some of these connectivity work, whether it's uh, device distribution events, um, these are opportunities for community partners to engage uh, folks, uh, to engage these families uh, in a way that they, they're not currently on like their caseload or they're not sort of being supported right now. Um, so if that family, you know, yes, the child can get on to do, uh, to, to, can do remote learning. Yes, the adult can get training in, uh, you know, workforce development skills or other opportunities as well. But it's also connecting those families to that organization, other organizations in that neighborhood uh, and to the city as well. So they can apply for housing grants assistance, um, whether it's immigration services, whether it's other uh, access points as well. And so we see, um, you know, really, you know, our community partners are at the core of everything that we're doing. You know, this is a project, you know, fundamental to getting kids online so they can learn effectively. But um, the, 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 the potential sort of transformative impact of having these households connected and having them connected to these community partners um, is really kind of like the next uh, phase of where we intend for Chicago to go. NDIA is very appreciative of Chicago Connected helping NDIA to update our startup manual. So uh, we'll put that in the chat for folks it, now, thanks to Chicago Connected, has uh, guidance regarding teaching digital literacy and forming partnerships during the age of COVID, because of course it was written pre-COVID. Uh, so that's fabulous. Thank you, Hal. Autumn, let's talk some more about your work. Um, you put a fabulous comment in the com in the in the chat about the words that you use. Talk about that, and then folks want to know: Is your survey public? Can they access it? So we have a link to our survey, but it's live for our residents to take the survey. Um, so I don't want you all to back my data, frankly. Um, we are planning to publish it and I'm happy to share the survey tool and the results. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking through what the right approach to that is and uh, my background is in urban planning and I teach civic engagement at the Glenn College of Public Affairs at OSU. So um, I consider myself somewhat of an expert in civic engagement and very intentional about the questions. So I think they're really good. Um, but I'm biased, so I'm happy to share mine and would encourage you to look at other um, other surveys as well. I'm, I'm so sorry. There's so many questions. Angela knows I just finished this survey, um, and so we just finished up a feasibility report around the next step. So 
Again, I introduced the survey with the thought that we could have easily taken FCC data, American Community uh, Survey data, and prescribed a solution for our neighborhood. But what I wanted to do was leverage the unique position that we have as a community-based organization to make a hyper-local neighborhood-based recommendation. Um, and so that's why we did this community engagement survey, and we're still doing it. So our kids in Columbus just went back to school a couple weeks ago, and so we're gonna keep surveying to really understand what that experience is like. I'll give you guys a sneak preview of the survey, if you will. There is a series of questions where we ask people if they have school-aged children in the home. And if they say yes, then the logic model takes them through some questions around, what are you concerned about? Is your internet too slow, too fast for what your kids need to do? Which is an experience that we had heard anecdotally back in March when kids were forced to go home and do virtual learning, that the hotspots and whatever low income or affordable provision they had was not fast enough for what was required for virtual learning. And so we asked people, are you concerned about that? How many days a week do you need to be on the internet? How many devices are you expecting to be on the internet? Again, many of us, even those of us who are privileged to have um, different levels of internet in our homes, none of us really could probably, except for maybe Angela, well, some of you may have been able to, I know I couldn't, let me speak for myself. I couldn't tell you how fast the internet was in my house, but boy, did I know a difference between what the usage was for me and my husband, both working virtually and trying to do virtual learning with our daughter. So when we got to the word, and it's very intentional that we say effective, it's about making sure that people have access to internet that gets them what they need. That a mom could be at home working and her three kids could be at home with devices. And that's also based on information that we got from the school district too, that they were sending two and three and maybe four devices to one address, which meant all of these kids are pulling down on that internet, trying to do a Zoom meeting for school or uploading documents. And so effective is important um, because you, Leon and Hal hit the nail on the head. People don't want um, the lesser version of something. And, and I, for me and, and our work at PACT, this is really about the dignity to participate fully in our society. There's an economic reason why we need to have effective internet for everyone. Um, and if we don't do it now, this divide is only going to get wider. So um, that answers your question. Um, I yeah, that's heard perfect. up about making sure people have equitable access. Thank you, Autumn. So let's talk a little bit about that advocacy piece of it. Amanda, can you talk to us about how folks can use your data or other data that you come across to make the advocacy pitch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanna pick up on something Autumn was just saying about dignity, right? Oftentimes when we think about advocacy, we think about it from a deficit lens. Oh my goodness, all these people don't have X and that needs to change. And that's can be an important argument, but I would lift up two other pieces to think about as we're all thinking about our own paths into advocacy. The first is most of the problems that we have in digital inclusion are structural problems that were created by public policies. And so the solutions to them need structural solutions that are led by public policies with community input. So I think it's really important to not sort of individualize or pathologize and say it's people's fault that they don't have skills or it's people's fault that they don't have enough money to pay for a broadband connection. These are structural problems. So what does it mean to have an advocacy solution? First of all, I want to warmly encourage all of you to steal my charts. Use them in your advocacy, use them in your PowerPoints, email me and tell me that you want to, you know, adapt one of them for something you're doing. Go right ahead, just put Credit National Skills Coalition in the low corner and you're good to go. Um, and I hope that you will use them when you talk to journalists, when you talk to philanthropy, when you talk to policymakers. But I think there's a couple of other things that I, I hope you'll take away as well. The first is around equity. Right? A lot of us care about advocacy because we care about people, because we care about equity in communities geographically, because we're very rooted in a place. I'm in Philadelphia because we care about communities of color, communities that might have low income. And I think it's really important to think about advocacy and equity in terms of capitalizing on the assets and the creativity and the ingenuity that communities already have. 
right? It's not about people are in need of some kind of noblesse oblige assistance. It's that people are ingeniously coming up with solutions and workarounds, but they shouldn't have to, right? Many of us saw the, the picture of the two young girls in the Taco Bell parking lot trying to do their homework. Well, on the one hand, that's incredibly determined of them. On the other hand, um, that's heartbreaking, right? That should not be the situation that folks are encountering in the country that we live in today. So whether your path into advocacy is, I have good work that we're doing as practitioners and I wanna make sure our elected officials know about it, great. If your path into advocacy is that you have something else you're trying to accomplish, maybe a public health goal, maybe an early child care and education goal, whatever it might be, and digital inclusion is a tool that will help you get to that goal, I hope that you'll think about the advocacy messages you've heard from my colleagues and from me today. And then thirdly, um, I think when we think about equity gaps in our communities, you know, there was a great question earlier from uh, one, of the, one of the attendees of today's discussion about whether we had data that's specific to immigrants and refugees. And Sabrina responded with some excellent resources. I'm dropping another link into the chat right now that is our applying a racial equity lens to digital literacy fact sheet, which has great data on Black, Latinx, Asian American and Pacific Islander immigrant and English learner populations and their digital literacy skills. So those are resources that you can use for your advocacy. The last and most important thing I will say is no one will ever care more about your community and the people you serve than you do. So finding a way to connect the dots between the people you serve on the ground and the policies that will make their lives better is what can help policymakers have that aha moment to say, oh, I heard that digital access was a problem with COVID, but now you're telling me a story about somebody who can't get rehired from their job because they can't do online COVID safety training because they don't have broadband internet access. And now I understand how this plays out in my community. Or you're telling me about how a small business in my community can't reopen because of their technology issues. So connecting those dots is the most important part of advocacy. Anyone else want to comment on the advocacy issue? Okay, then I'm going to go to philanthropy. So this has come up as one of the questions. Um, one of the questions, a couple of the questions actually. So Autumn, who's paying for your survey? So we've been um, fortunate in Columbus to have a couple of uh, large donations come in for us and really I am not a fundraiser so I would say you don't have to be a fundraiser to do this and to attract funding um, like Leon's and, um, and others and other cities Hal and, and Roberto may have some experiences too so let me just put that out there not a fundraiser at all um, but uh, we've been fortunate that uh, one the Columbus Foundation actually helped fund um, two pieces of important um, study, if you will, of our work. One, they helped us fund um, paying people to do our door-to-door -door survey. So we employed six people from our local community to do the door-to-door -door survey. This is something that we've done in the past. Um, we're a 10-year-old organization, and so we have relationships. Again, unique position of being in your neighborhood, and I can't underscore enough what Amanda said about you know your place really well. Um, and so we really know our people. And so we were able to employ people to do the door-to-door -door surveys, which is why we got so many people to take the survey. Somebody that looked familiar was coming to their door. It didn't look like um, somebody coming to sell them something or anything nefarious. It was a neighbor that they knew. So we paid people to do the survey in large part from a donation, a grant from the Columbus Foundation. We also had the opportunity to have AECOM do a feasibility study of our neighborhood to see what would it look like to introduce a new technology of some sort um, to help us get more affordable and effective internet in our neighborhood. That study was nearly $20,000 and the Columbus uh, Foundation paid for that. Um, and I'm so incredibly grateful to Doug Kreiler and his team for supporting that work because it positions us not only to support our community into this next phase of exploring, um, closing the digital divide, but it also positions our community at large to have a case study that you can solve problems 
in a place-based way, which is, you know, my kind of motto is that place truly, truly matters. Um, and so if we look at this from one neighborhood, it's something that can be replicated in other communities. Um, in addition to that, our city and county here pooled um, some of their CARES Act dollars into what they call a resilience fund um, on a whim almost. I, I don't even want to say on a whim. This entire journey has just been a whirlwind for us. Um, we applied to the resilience fund and said, if we got money, we would buy devices for people. Um, whatever they needed, we would identify um, a pathway for our neighborhood residents to access devices 100% um, free to them. I didn't expect to get that money, if I'm being wholly honest, I, but I'm so grateful. Um, so it was just legislated on Monday that we will get $200,000 devices for our community. We're not going to do that in isolation. We've got our broadband study where we're going to look at affordable broadband. We're going to give out these devices and we're talking with local companies and businesses around literacy. Um, so we have been fortunate to have both philanthropic and municipal government support for our strategy. But what I'm really hopeful about is that our experience, our survey, I'm gonna share it. Um, all of our work can be replicated in other neighborhoods. We know the experience on the Near East side of Columbus is not unique at all. Um, and so we also have um, a community of practice that we're leading through what's called the Purpose Built Communities Network. Um, so PACT is one of 25 cities that approaches our work in this way. And so I've got colleagues in New Orleans, and um, you know, in North Carolina and Indiana, all over the country, where we're talking about, you know, how do we solve um, these problems? So again, Columbus Foundation, God bless them, um, the city and the county, um, and we're we're going to be a case study. So again, I'll share all of this freely because once we solve it for our community, then I want everybody to be able to do that too, and I want to learn from you all as well. So Autumn, if you could share just like. A, a you know word doc or a PDF or whatever with the NDIA listserv uh, for any I should have started this at the very beginning if you're not already on the NDIA listserv that's where a lot of this conversation happens via email uh, so join it's on our website uh, we'll stick the URL for that in here and the other thing I think it's important to for folks to to hear what Autumn's saying is that this digital inclusion wasn't something she was doing. Look how much Autumn knows, <laughs> right? Like she's just figured it out. And even if you haven't been doing it before, you can figure it out too. And because there's this grand community to say, here's what I know, take what you want. Uh, and we have the digital inclusion startup manual. We have a lot of the resources on the website. It is very doable to figure this out. We don't all have a Leon. I know we all wish we had a Leon, but we don't. Uh, so um, well, let me go. And, but um, Angela, can I talk also about the philanthropy piece as well? That Just was right my there. next question for you. Yes, Leon. Okay, great. No, because my question to you is how long has NDIA, NDIA been around? Five and a half years. What's the average number of foundations that have been to your conference? I'd say total maybe five. Thank you. So again, um, I bring that up because again, um, I'm going to I'm going to give a good and bad, you know, in in the spirit of philanthropy, um, because they're just so saying you want advice, ask for money. You want money, ask for advice um, when you when you go to any foundation. <laughs> um, in the past, pre-COVID. Unfortunately, there were very, very few foundations that were even thinking about this. They thought of it as a technology issue and they don't do tech grants. They did in the past, they gave away computers back in the 80s and 90s. They gave, they gave monies to start a computer lab here and there. They did their dude and they moved on. They're all about education, workforce development, um, racial equity, um, um, social services, arts, culture. Um, neighborhood revitalization, the list goes, and climate change. The list goes on and on and on. So there were only a handful of us that were really deeply embedded in funding and addressing the digital divide. We can, I can count them on one hand. <clears throat> and I gave talks at the National Council of Foundations annual conference probably about four years ago about, guys, you need to pay attention to this. And again, some moved a little, some didn't. Yeah, so this moment that we're in, when all the kids got sent home, hit all the people in philanthropy in the gut because we all care about our kids. It had it not been for the school shutting down, I would, I would question how many people in philanthropy would still be funding. 
in, in now this digital divide. But once the kids get sent home and you saw all the poor stories on the local news about how kids can't remote learn and things of that nature, then everybody started pulling out their checkbooks, both corporations as well as philanthropy. So I applaud all the people, all the philanthropy that are now engaged deeply in this and realizing that it does matter. <clears throat> but I want, us, I want us all to be mindful of that in philanthropy, we can be fickle. An issue today is not an issue tomorrow. Uh, because there's all kind of issues. We're, we're still trying to solve homelessness. We're still trying to solve, solve mental, mental and substance abuse and all these kinds of, those issues, those, those first and second, second world issues haven't gone away. So again, take this opportunity to definitely connect because again, the oven's hot um, to tap into this and maybe there will be some longevity with this um, with this as far as more in philanthropy. I've seen more people in philanthropy that have reached out and say, hey, I want to give $15,000. I want to give $100,000. I want to give whatever than I've ever seen in my life. Um, and, and I haven't been in philanthropy for long, but I'm telling you, it, this, is, this is a unique opportunity for those of you in your respective communities to um, tap into the philanthropic sector and have them help you help your community with this digital divide. But to Amanda's point, this is not a one and done issue because of public policy. And does philanthropy have the have have the stick to itiveness to address this on a federal level, on a public policy level, so much so that we do get the transformative change that we truly, truly need? Because philanthropy isn't going to fund us out of this. But we can use those philanthropic dollars to help lobby, to help build reports, to provide studies to our legislators, to really, you know, again, pressure a lot of things. That's what's going to really um, address this issue systemically. Wow, that was really perfect, Leon. Um, anyone else want to add to Leon's comments? I would just say that I, I mean it's hard to uh, go after that, but but I would just say I, I think what you know, in tremendous points uh, and as someone who has uh, you know gotten on the bandwagon late myself in terms of being involved in this issue, but I think uh, Leon to your point, like seeing the the fine connections between philanthropy and the issues that they have traditionally cared about. So you I mean you cited some of those uh, workforce development, economic development, neighborhood revitalization and showing how none of that obviously right now is possible without connectivity. But I think um, this moment in having some type of community care so much about connectivity really can help show them that we can't go back to life the way that it was before. Uh, oh, folks can go to a library or oh, folks, you know, people can go to a free, you know, uh, you know, a Wi-Fi hotspot or something somewhere to connect. Um, and I think that's, you know, and I'll be honest and I'll say that in Chicago, our philanthropic partners didn't want to do this for six months or 12 months. They wanted it to be a two year, uh, you know, initiative that then that the city and CPS, public school district actually said, we're going to do this for another two years. So to making a, a tr they wanted to see skin in the game up front through CARES Act, but they also wanted to see a public policy initiative uh, behind it. And so um, I, I think that, but uh, you know, the points you made are, are terrific. Uh, and so just wanted to echo that as well. Okay, so we are about at our hour. If anyone has last questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll make sure our panelists answers them. Panelists, is there anything you wanted to make sure that you covered today? I've learned that from all the journalists. They ask me that at the end of every interview. Um, I would just ask folks, if you are doing something that you're really proud of and you wanna brag about, I would love to hear about it because one of the most important things I do at National Skills Coalition is lift up important work that's happening at the state and local level and help policymakers understand how investing in policies can make more things like that happen in their communities. So if you're doing something on digital inclusion that you're really proud of, please feel free to drop me an email or reach out on social media and connect and tell me what you're doing. And I, the one thing that I, I wanted to mention, and I'll answer a question that was in the um, Q&A as well. Uh, one, for us in Columbus, and as Angela said, you do not have to be an expert in this. I'm an urban planner. Um, I know a lot about city and regional planning. I'm not an engineer. Um, I'm learning every day more and more about this space, but it's important because I'm viewing this as an equity issue. And um, the digital divide has something to do with economic impact. 
Um, we have to think about the future. How are people coming forward and being able to, you know, reach and achieve optimal health and well-being? So um, I really just want to underscore that point. But to that end, as we think about advocacy and lobbying, one of the things that just never dawned on me until recently was that, um, you know, whose job is it anyway? to think about a community's digital strategy. Um, a CIO's job is to make sure that the employees have computers that work and printers that print and not to diminish their role at all in municipal governments or organizations because I'm grateful that we have CIOs who you know, are providing these provisions, but when do they have time to do digital strategy? Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but it really begs the question of if we know that the internet is a required platform for life, it is a required utility for people to operate in education and work and health Health and social, um, somebody should be thinking about it and focusing on it. So we've had great opportunities in many communities where we've had public and private and philanthropic folks come together and solve problems. But if it was someone's job, then we wouldn't have to build these ad hoc groups in moments of crisis. And so that's kind of my moment that I'm really reflecting on a lot is whose job is it anyway? Um, and you know, maybe someone much smarter than me and has been in this work for some time has some solutions to that. But I think we need to think about that long-term in our communities that someone should be focusing on that. Um, our governor established a statewide organization called Innovate Ohio, but what if we have those at the regional and local levels? And so this is just me putting out a thought and an idea the question that was in the chat, and I don't know, Leon or Hal, if you guys have uh, thoughts about this one, but I can answer for Columbus was, um, you know, what is the experience of nonprofits and social service agencies who are serving people? Do they have gaps um, and how are they making their provisions? Um, I can say that I don't know offhand or really anecdotally. I do know that the same people who have supported PACT in moving forward in this exploration are also supporting our nonprofit and social service agency. So the city and the county, and we actually have a chamber of nonprofits, it's called the Human Service Chamber of Columbus and Franklin County. Um, so these agencies are being supported. I'm not sure specifically on internet and technology provisions, but I'd be curious, Leon, and how if the nonprofit community has technology needs too that you could speak to from your communities. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, actually where in Cleveland, where that came out was through our COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund when all the nonprofits started applying for it and they weren't applying for PPE equipment. Um, they were applying for, hey, we need computers or we don't have the right technology to now engage with the residents that we're servicing. And so we need to upgrade our technologies. We need to invest in certain platforms. We need, to, we need to do other things so that now we can operate in a more hybrid model because we can't bring those residents to our facility anymore because of shelter in place and social distancing issues. So when you started seeing a lot of the shared collaboration of funders, you know, we had over 40 funders in Cleveland that were pitching in for the COVID-19 um, rapid response fund, and this kept coming up. And they were like, damn, why does this thing keep coming up? Maybe we should pay attention then, not the first couple of rounds of funding, but by the fifth or sixth round of COVID-19 funding, they started funding digital equity. They started funding technology, they started giving money to nonprofits to help them address their particular issue because they said, this isn't going away. So um, absolutely, absolutely, um, that is. And the only other thing I'll say, um, tying into what Autumn was talking about from, um, from um, equity, there are a number of scholars that are also making the argument and I'm starting to buy into it, where they said, we've been talking about the digital divide all wrong. Um, and we've been using this social construct differently as opposed to really it is this lack of social inclusion. Um, it's a social inclusion or social exclusion issue. Um, as opposed to a technocratic, techno-deterministic approach towards it. So, um, and, I, and when you think about that, then it now flips, flips, the, um, flips the problem to now all the issues that philanthropy and, and nonprofits all care about, social issues, social service issues, social equity issues. And technology is just, an, is just another vehicle that we now have to make sure that we want all our residents to be socially included in today's society. They need to be digitally and connected digitally literate, digital, digitally accessible. Angela, can I just quickly chime in? I know we've got a switch. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to share, and this is something I've been mentioning with Angela for a while now, in my realm with community economic developers, back to your question, Autumn, is uh, 
I've been able to frame it, of course, as a, as a social equity issue. Uh, but when you start talking about moms and pops that cannot compete because they don't have an online presence or because they don't have the skills, you get the attention of workforce developers, you get the attention of economic developers. And so just like Leon explained, it's just how you frame it, right? How you frame the concept, how you frame the issue. I have gotten some traction and COVID has helped tremendously in that regard where people realize, oh, I can't remote work. I'm now list a hearing of businesses that are talking to providers to ensure that their workers have decent connectivity at home. When before COVID, that was not even on their radar. But now they realize that their workers are not as productive as they could be, or they're losing workers because of this situation. So it's all about how you frame it, right? It's public policy 101. But in my experience, uh, what we're trying to do is at the local level is come up with this digital inclusion task force. Yes, target the disadvantage, target minorities. That's always an issue. But if we can spin it a little bit where we can bring in the heavyweights as the businesses and others, where do your workers have the digital skills, right? Do your moms and pops, can they compete, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to chime in to that, Angela. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, so we've added a few more links in the chat based upon the conversation the panelists were just having, one of which is the uh, NDIA's COVID resources includes if you want to have your community doing the things like you're hearing these communities doing, we have a whole list of those who are really rock starring it out. Um, none of them are perfect, right? But they all have some aspect of collaboration and resources going to this issue. And so it gives you a place to start if you're trying to convince the folks in your community. You can use the news articles and the write-ups such as those that have been shared, but the full list is on that. NDIAs. We call it a local COVID list because really I don't know what to call it. <laughs> the real description is like too many words long. Uh, and then the other thing that we added in here per Autumn's comments is there is a guidebook on building a digital inclusion coalition. And so that is something NDIA has been working with local communities around uh, the country that have really strong digital inclusion coalitions and quite a few of them are active in the NDIA community. Uh, actually, I guess all of them would be active in the NDIA community, but the coalition guidebook is a good starting place. If you're like, how do we build the coalition? That's a good place to start. So I think we're going to wrap it up because we're past our hour and I think we've answered most of all. Or There's almost one all the question that I'm wondering, Angela, if you can answer. It seems yeah. My, um, because two people just asked this, so I just want to squeeze it in real quick, but okay. advocacy perspective, I think about the internet as a utility now because people need it for their life. Um, and I've been using this analogy that, you know, there was a time where people had to go to the well and get their water. And so having internet at home right now is some people have running water and some people are still having to go to the well. It's a significant equity issue. Have you, NDIA or others, use internet as a utility, as a lobbying platform? Um, and I think other that resonates with others in the audience. Yeah, yeah, certainly, because it is essential today. So I think the, the language is going to vary, whether we're calling it a utility or we're calling it essential or we're calling it something else. The point being, it's not any of those, it's not considered any of those things in legal terms right now. There's very lightly regulated. There's no price controls. It's nobody's job to make sure everybody has access to the internet in the US. I mean, it's you all's job because you decided to take it on. But it's like nobody's getting let that in a government position. That's not, we might, some of us think the FCC should be doing it, but the folks that are in charge at the FCC right now say, not our job. So then whose job is it if folks that, that we think should be doing it aren't doing it? So that is a big advocacy push where we all need to be talking about that. And it's coming up now um, because of COVID. And it's also coming up in the, in the realm of the no shut off moratorium kind of topics that we're hearing. Don't turn off people's electricity. Don't turn off their water, right? They need their gas. They need their internet. And it gets thrown in even though there's no method right now to make sure that it's not happening. So, so we, can, we have to figure out how we talk about it and at the same time come up with those actual solutions. Uh, one of which would be a broadband subsidy. Another would be let's actually regulate some of it. Like let's know what we're paying. Here's a little fun fact and then I'll let you all go. The federal government does not keep data on how much it actually costs to buy internet in the United States. 
Why is that? Oh, who controls that data? Oh, there we go. <laughs> So those are the kinds of things we need to change because how do, how do we go after affordability if we don't even have government data on what people are really paying? Okay, this is amazing. You all are amazing. This has been recorded. It will be posted to the NDIA website. So you'll be able to easily share it with your friends. And we'll see you all on the listserv. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. Thank you.